I guess there couldn't have been uh, a more like, you know, timely topic than what we are having today. Uh, as uh, we all know, uh, being in child neurology, how we are witnessing uh, almost a second pandemic of uh, developmental disorders and autism spectrum disorder. And uh, there is uh, like, you know, nothing really, you know, no other disease, which is more uh, like, you know, treated with everything like music therapy to uh, supplements, to medications, to yoga, to hypotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess like, you know, uh, it is something which uh, we should be discussing time to time. And uh, evidence for complementary and alternative medicine in autism is the topic for today. And uh, to moderate the session today, we have uh, Dr. Ravi Kant uh, Tangela, and uh, he will be introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Nitya Mukti. Uh, so uh, I will briefly outline the, like, you know, today's moderator, uh, Dr. Ravi Kant Tangela is a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And uh, he runs a child guidance clinic uh, at uh, uh, Vishalipuram, and uh, he's owner of the, that place. And Dr. Little Wings Child Development Center, and he's director for the same. And uh, he's been trained at PGI Chandigarh, DM Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in 2020, and uh, uh, he's MD and MBBS from Osmania Medical College and SBS Medical College. Uh, his skills uh, are listed here, which are uh, something which are very, very relevant for today's topic, including CBT, behavior modification, social skill training, and medical management of psychiatric disorders in children and adolescents. So we have a very right uh, uh, moderating uh, person and uh, also a very apt speaker. So look forward to a great uh, session for all of us today. And I hand over to Dr. Ravi Khan to introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Ravi Khan. So I'm going to introduce the speaker, Dr. Nitya Murthy. Uh, she did her MBBS from Gandhi Medical College, Hyderabad, and did her psychiatry, MB psychiatry from Ashram, Eluru. And uh, she did her master degree in psychology from IGNO uh, Open University and fellowship in child adolescent psychiatry from Asha Hospital. So I, I'm, I'm uh, privileged to know her since last seven, eight years. And I know her work ethics and she's very dedicated. And uh, her interests are in treatment and management of autism, ADHD, childhood anxieties, depression, behavioral issues, and mental health awareness, helping adults battle psychiatric issues like depression, anxiety, OCD, uh, sleep problems, and psychosis. And we know this today's topic is uh, very important. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to waste further time. And uh, uh, this uh, complementary and alternative medicines are very, very important uh, to understand the evidence base. And uh, Nitya has worked very hard for this. I, I knew her uh, uh, since a long time, and she's been working on this topic since a good amount of time. So over to Nitya, uh, waiting for your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravi Khan, for the introduction. Um, I have started my journey in child psychiatry in 2018. And uh, since then, I met and interacted with some amazing people uh, in this field, uh, Dr. Ravi Khan being one of them. So thank you for uh, being in this session to moderate, sir. And I also uh, thank uh, AOCN, uh, for uh, the opportunity and privilege given to me to present in this session. I hope I do, do justice to it. So uh, without much delay, I'll quickly start my presentation. I hope uh, you're able to see, see my slides. Yeah, very clearly, very clearly, yeah. Thank you. So uh, today's topic, uh, I'll go about uh, this way. 
uh, initially I'll talk about what constitutes uh, CAMs. I'm only talking about biological therapies today. And uh, uh, what are the various CAMs and uh, what are the hypotheses or the rationale for studying them and the various studies um, uh, and what can we conclude from those studies. And then briefly summarize uh, what we understand. And then uh, briefly about uh, guidelines for what we can discuss with our uh, patients or their families uh, with respect to the evidence. So um, I was trying to uh, look up what actually constitutes complementary and alternative medicine. Because as I was going through the studies, I found that, you know, it was not, the boundaries are not very clear. Like, for example, N-acetylcysteine was considered a mainstream medication in some studies, whereas it was a complementary medication in some studies, similarly with melatonin. So I looked up the definition and what it says, WHO definition says that it is a broad set of healthcare practices that are not part of the country's own tradition and not integrated into the dominant healthcare system. So what I understand or gather from this is that it would vary from country to country or the boundaries are not very clear. For example, um, traditional Chinese medicine uh, is widely used in China alongside uh, modern medicine. So it could be a part of the dominant healthcare system. So boundaries are not very clear. Um, to simplify, um, these, are the, uh, these are easily available over the counter or these do not usually require your prescription. And they're not well regulated with respect to their safety, quality and efficacy like the mainstream medications. So we know that children with autism uh, use uh, complementary and alternative medications quite a lot. Um, it is seen that up to 75% of children with autism use it. Um, and uh, there could be various reasons for this. Uh, we know that the evidence-based treatments like uh, the various ABA-based interventions or speech occupational therapy may not be accessible to some parents or uh, it might be a financial issue for them. Or uh, it is also difficult to predict uh, each child's response to the uh, therapies. So parents are often confused or they want to try what is available easily. And uh, we also know that um, there are no medications for core symptoms. We have Risperidone and Aripiprazole, which are FDA approved, uh, but they have a range of side effects. So parents uh, may be advised by their friends or relatives or over the internet and uh, uh, to use these complementary alternative treatments. So they're often perceived as natural and they consider not to have much side effects or they're called supplements. So the most common ones that are used are special diets or dietary supplements like vitamins, GFCF diet. They are the most common ones and they are used to treat both uh, core symptoms or they're used also for sleep, gastrointestinal issues or attention issues, etc. So these are based on the premise that there are physiological abnormalities in autism and that if they are corrected or improved, the symptoms may also improve. That is, we have several uh, hypotheses. Um, we do not know the exact geopathogenesis, the exact mechanism, but there are some findings in certain studies and based on that, uh, those particular treatments were studied. For example, uh, based on immune system modulation for GFCF diet or probiotics or antioxidant act, uh, activity. Um, some studies showed that autism children have high inflammatory activity in the brain or CSF. So some molecules were studied like that. Modulation of neurotransmitters, neuroprotection, or removal of toxic heavy metals. We'll go into details about each of these further. So I will start with the first one, that is melatonin. Uh, we know that uh, 50 to 80 percent of uh, children with autism have insomnia. It is quite high compared to the uh, typically developing peers. So this can lead to significant impairments uh, with respect to the child's learning or uh, may cause severe behavioral issues. Um, uh, and it's also known that sleep hygiene or behavioral interventions are the first line of treatment and medication is only after that or as an adjuvant to that. So melatonin is an extensively studied uh, molecule. 
So we have multiple double blind placebo control studies, and it is one of the best study CAMs uh, that are used uh, for autism. And uh, this uh, randomized double blind placebo control multicenter study uh, studied uh, pediatric prolonged release melatonin for 13 weeks, followed by an open label treatment for 91 weeks, and then two weeks of placebo to uh, look for withdrawal. It was found that uh, the children slept average of 57.5 minutes longer at night, while it was significantly lesser with placebo, and the sleep latency uh, time also decreased significantly. So it is probably safe to conclude that it is an effective treatment for uh, children and adolescents for sleep issues and insomnia, and uh, without any significant adverse effects or withdrawal effects. Next, uh, uh, looking at N-acetylcysteine. So uh, this is a derivative of a natural amino acid, L-cysteine. So we are aware that amino acids are precursors to neurotransmitters or they themselves act as neurotransmitters. And L-cysteine is a precursor for uh, glutathione. So N-acetylcysteine um, has been used to treat glutathione deficiency in several other conditions uh, like genetic and metabolic conditions and hence it was also studied for autism. And uh, the hypothesis or the mechanism is that uh, there is uh, reduced glutathione levels in the brain of these children and um, because of which there is increased uh, glutamate excitotoxicity and also increased oxidative stress. So uh, L-cysteine is a precursor to glutathione, uh, will correct the deficiency and thereby will uh, reduce the symptoms of autism. So when we look at the uh, recent uh, studies, um, the recent meta-analysis uh, of five RCTs um, up to a duration of up to 12 weeks um, found that uh, it is safe and tolerable for improving comorbid symptoms and not the core symptoms in uh, hyperactivity and irritability. And uh, another meta-analysis for restricted repetitive behaviors alone, so uh, did not find much benefit for the same. But these studies were again extremely limited. They had a small sample size and uh, there was a high risk of bias. So it is difficult to make effective conclusions based on this. So it appears to be that there is no effect on core symptoms and there's probable benefit in hyperactivity and irritability. Uh, no significant side effects in the short term. They were studied for a duration up to 12 weeks. and But long-term effects are still not. Next is L-carnosine. This is also an amino acid derivative containing beta-alanine and histidine, also uh, known to have antioxidant properties or GABA-modulating effects and neuroprotective effects also. So recent meta-analysis looked at five RCTs, four of which were double-blind placebo controlled and one open label study for up to duration of 10 weeks. And uh, even here, even though the meta-analysis favored L-carnosine, uh, the results were not statistically significant and there were no significant adverse effects either. Um, again, these studies were all limited by small sample sizes and there is methodological heterogeneity. That is, uh, there were different scales or different outcome measures, the dosage duration among these children varied. So it was difficult to make comparisons. So it appears to be that there is inconclusive benefit for poor and associated symptoms, but no adverse effects in the short term. Um, and it is insufficient to recommend it regularly for all children with autism. We require better studies or more data on this. Omega-3 fatty acids. Um, we are aware that it's uh, very important for cerebral growth and development, um, formation of synapse and memory and cognitive development. So um, the hypothesis is that the children with uh, ASD have picky eating and uh, hence they are more prone for nutritional deficiencies. Um, and since we know that this is an essential fatty acid, it has to be obtained through the diet. So through uh, seafood or fish um, or other grains like soy or flax seeds, etc. So the premise is that modern diet is also deficient in omega-3 fatty acids because of in increased consumption of processed foods. Because hydrogenation of processing foods removes omega-3 fatty acids. So then this started being uh, studied. And a number of studies have compared um, 
who have uh, reported low level of omega-3 acids in children with ASD. There are uh, some studies reporting this. So, so Cochrane review was done. Only two RCTs were included, that two with small sample sizes, but they did not find uh, much benefit for social interaction, communication, hyperactivity, or stereotype. Then uh, a few more studies were done. A recent meta-analysis looked at uh, 13 trials with five RCTs. So um, this was uh, for a duration of up to 12 months. Um, this meta-analysis found that despite showing some minimal benefits, uh, on further subgroup analysis, there is lack of evidence of beneficial role of omega-3 and omega-6 in treating autism, but uh, there were no significant adverse effects reported. Again, these studies too were uh, quite limited uh, in their methodology and uh, poor study design was there, small samples. Um, another uh, meta-analysis looked at uh, re restricted repetitive behaviors uh, in these children, and they did not find much benefit compared to placebo. Uh, another interesting study, which is a 90-day RCT, which is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, studied preterm children um, who were uh, 18 to 38 months and who showed features of autism. So overall, the results were not statistically significant, but the magnitude of effect for sensory issues was uh, medium to large. So this concluded that probably there could be some benefit in sensory processing issues for children who were born preterm and who are so showing early signs of autism. But we need larger RCTs uh, to confirm this. So overall, it appears that it is still inconclusive and uh, it is too early or premature to state that it is successful adjuvant nutritional therapy for treating autism. Coming to vitamin supplementation, also very commonly used. And uh, again, uh, these children have uh, uh, poor eating patterns or probably altered gastrointestinal absorption. So we know that these vitamins and minerals are uh, important in the production of neurotransmitters. So um, there are very few studies on this. Um, a Cochrane review studied uh, vitamin B6 and magnesium. Only three RCTs were included and uh, only 28 children. Um, and uh, they said that if no recommendation can be advanced based on this for using B6 and magnesium as a treatment. And uh, vitamin B, B12 was studied only in one RCT alone. And uh, uh, they did find benefits with B12 supplementation. But, but again, uh, we should use caution in interpreting this because uh, the studies are uh, very less and it's uh, there is poor design. And the children were also on multiple supplements at that time. And it is in injectable form. So there is difficulty with um, administering to children also. Vitamin D, again, there were only three RCTs. Uh, there was a small but significant effect for hyperactivity, not for core symptoms. But again, they did not recommend it as a monotherapy. It could be used to complement other treatments uh, because it is important for brain development to the suggestion. Again, uh, this study also was underpowered and had a high risk of bugs. Vitamin C, uh, there was only one RCT. Again, this also showed benefit, but we cannot draw effective conclusions based on this. And no side effects were. So, um, although uh, it may correct specific nutritional deficiencies in the children with autism, if they have nutritional deficiencies, then there could be some benefit. Uh, but whether it affects core symptoms or associated symptoms of autism, we don't have any evidence as of now. And uh, few children may need nutrients because they may be deficient in it. But if everybody is given, it may lead to over supplementation and probably uh, potential harmful effects also. Next is tetrahydrobiopterin. Uh, this was also studied because it was it is a cofactor in the synthesis of neurotransmitters like catecholamines and sertraline. And uh, there were some studies which found low tetrahydrobiopterin in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid of these children. There are very few studies, only two RCDs, and uh, up to six months duration, um, very small sample sizes. There was no significant improvement in CAR scores, but there is some benefit in uh, social awareness uh, hyperactivity, inappropriate speech, etc. in subset of children with higher IQ. No adverse effects were reported. Again, uh, this uh, data is insufficient to conclude that it is actually beneficial in these children. Coming to gluten-free, casein-free diet, uh, widely used. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, the hypothesis is that 
there is high prevalence of gastrointestinal issues in children and uh, because of this uh, this started being studied if uh, gastrointestinal system has a role in the development of autism symptoms and some studies showed that there are higher levels of pro inflammatory cytokines after the children were exposed to food from gluten casein and soy and uh, so they started investigating food allergy and autism so the opioid excess theory is called so when these children take a diet with gluten and casein it is broken down into opioid peptides in the intestine and it passes through the gut uh, they enter through the leaky gut and then it reaches the brain and interferes with brain development leading to symptoms of autism so based on uh, a few case reports a lot of people started using this diet extensively in the last decade and then um, a cochrane review uh, in 2008 uh, included two rcts um, and then they concluded that there is no evidence uh, for using this diet uh, it is uncertain is what they concluded and uh, subsequently there was a scandinavian british study uh, which included 72 children it for a duration of 24 months in uh, two stages that is uh, quite a long period and uh, they they found that they did find benefit in some children with autism and they found that uh, uh, there were probably some specific phenotypes for uh, some children who might respond better than other children and we need to identify the responders is what they suggested but the study also had uh, limitations that uh, it was not they uh, blinded that is the children had to be uh, the mothers have to give the children the diet and uh, there was no uh, they had to be supplemented for deficiencies so it was not blinded and there was no placebo subsequently uh, uh, a few meta analysis uh, looked at um, a few rcts done in the recent times so there was a positive effect of diet therapy but there is no correlation with the length of interventions and it was not statistically significant the other meta analysis suggested that um, it may cause gastrointestinal side effects but did not find any benefits again um, these studies were limited by a um, high dropout rate that is it was there was a difficulty adhering to the diet it is a very restrictive diet and uh, there was also lack of uniformity there was lack of uniformity uh, with respect to the diet that was given to the children so the quality of evidence was uh, also was having a high risk of bias so current evidence again is insufficient to draw any solid conclusions we require more well designed and multi center studies uh, with larger sample sizes the other aspects that we need to consider um, when uh, this diet uh, is being taken is that these children already have uh, very picky eating or uh, selective eating patterns and this might just get worse uh, by giving such a restricted diet and uh, again it can contribute to sleep issues or behavioral issues and there is a risk of weight loss or uh, malnutrition if the diet is not properly replaced and uh, the, there is difficulty adhering to the diet also it is very restrictive and uh, it is difficult to procure the diet make a separate food for the child and uh, it may add to the family's existing stress and uh, it is also important to uh, ensure that the child gets adequate nutritional support uh, especially with respect to vitamin d calcium protein intake all these things have to be monitored so that the child doesn't develop deficiencies and uh, it is better if they we do it with the consultation of a registered dietitian so that the nutrients are replaced properly so coming to uh, probiotics um this is extensively studied uh, now um like a lot of studies are coming up and uh, brain gut microbiota axis that is brain and uh, gut are connected and uh, this involves vagus nerve hp axis neurotransmitters etc and there were animal studies in rodents which also showed that uh, it is related to social behavior the hypothesis is that these children have uh, altered gut bacteria or dysbiosis and then um if when there is altered gut bacteria and it is connected through the to the brain through vagus nerve through hp axis through neurotransmitters and neuromodulators and then it causes altered neurochemical signaling and disruptive connectivity uh, leading to autism uh, behavior abnormalities or autism symptoms 
So uh, a recent meta-analysis studied uh, 13 uh, studies, among which seven were double-blind RCTs and six were non-RCTs for duration up to three months. The sample sizes were 8 to 85. And uh, they, con they concluded that the RCTs, which were of better methodological quality, did not show any improvement uh, with uh, uh, symptoms of autism. But the non-RCTs, which were of poorer study design, they actually reported improvement. And there were no serious adverse effects that were reported. Again, these studies were uh, having several limitations with respect to poor design and uh, inadequately powered and high risk of bias. So again, the current evidence base is in, uh, inconclusive and limited uh, to suggest that uh, probiotics have a beneficial effect. And we also know that short-term supplementation appears to be say, generally safe, but long-term supplementation with uh, repeatedly uh, we don't know the effect on the gut microbiome. We don't know the safety of these approaches. Next uh, is secretin. Uh, the hypothesis is that secretin helps in digestion. So it restricts the flow of these opioid peptides across the blood brain barrier. So um, this started being studied when three children with autism were uh, being uh, studied for uh, pancreatic enzymes. Uh, the digestive enzymes were being studied for endoscopy and they were given secretin and uh, they accidentally found that there were benefits uh, and improvements in these children and then they started being studied extensively and uh, a Cochrane review of uh, 16 RCTs in 900 children were included. Um, they concluded that secretin given either as a small a single dose or multiple doses has no benefit in treating the poor symptoms of autism in these children and uh, that the evidence does not support using or recommending say, secretin as treatment. Next, coming to camel milk. Uh, camel milk has less cholesterol and lactose than cow milk and more vitamins and enzymes um, like peptidoglycan recognition protein. So there is, they have a role in preventing food allergy and modulating immune system. This is the hypothesis. So it was studied in two RCTs for a very short duration, only two weeks small samples like 45, 65 children and they did report significant improvements and uh, did mention some adverse effects but uh, there is high risk of bias and uh, both the studies were done by the same group uh, and uh, the findings are yet to be replicated by others. Herbal medicine, um, traditional Chinese uh, medicine is what we are talking about. So there is a systematic review of 13 RCTs uh, with 567 patients uh, or children were included, less than 18 years. And uh, they did find improvement in uh, CAR scores, either uh, both alone as well as with conventional therapy, uh, which is other therapies like ABA, etc. And integrative therapies also. Uh, integrative by, by meaning other uh, traditional Chinese medicine like other herbs or uh, um, acupuncture, ac acupressure, etc. So the findings uh, were encouraging, but it was inconclusive owing to the low methodological quality. And uh, there were a lot of herbal medicines that were used. There was, they were very diverse and a small sample size. So it is, uh, we cannot make effective conclusions of benefit based on this. Chelation therapy. So chelation therapy involves administering a chelating substance. So that binds to heavy metals like uh, lead and mercury, and then it is excreted in the U. So initial studies did find some higher levels of heavy metals in autism children, but later on research did not find any correlation with uh, heavy metals. So, but then almost 7% of children with ASD continue to have uh, this as treatment. And it's important to be aware that uh, it has potential adverse effects like hypertension, hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, hypocalcemia, etc. In fact, it has led to the death of one five-year-old child with uh, fatal myocardial necrosis. So uh, a Cochrane review of uh, chelation therapy excluded nine studies and included only one study uh, with 77 children. And they concluded that it is not recommended and uh, the risks associated with uh, chelation therapy outweigh any uh, potential benefits. They also suggested that no further trials are recommended until there is an evidence connecting heavy metals and autism. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, in this, uh, the patient 
or the child breathes 100% oxygen inside a hyperbaric chamber, which is which has a pressure more than the sea level pressure. So this is the treatment which has been used for carbon monoxide poisoning, gas gangrene, air embolism, etc. But uh, uh, the hypothesis is that in children with autism, there is a lower cerebral perfusion or there is hypoxia the brain. So uh, based on this, um, inhalation of oxygen at atmospheric pressure uh, improves the hypoxia. So it decreases oxidative stress and inflammation. So um, again, uh, Cochrane review included only one RCT and uh, uh, 20 sessions, one hour each for 10 weeks, 60 children were included and they did not find any benefits for this. And uh, also there is a risk of possible adverse effects like barotrauma, pulmonary edema, etc. And they suggested that the focus of research should shift towards more important uh, studies like behavioral and other developmental interventions, etc. So intravenous immunoglobulin, um, um, the there is said to be immune system dysfunction in children with autism. There were some studies which suggested that uh, uh, fetal brain development is re related to maternal immune activation during pregnancy. And uh, there were also some studies suggesting that there is an elevation in inflammatory cytokines in the brain. And uh, IV immunoglobulin is said to have anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, there are no RCTs. Uh, this only open label trials, case series and case reports, and with, with smaller sample sizes. Uh, they uh, there is probable benefit in some children with immune system abnormalities, and no significant adverse effects were reported in this meta-analysis. But um, there were serious adverse effects reported in other studies, um, like renal failure, vascular thrombosis, or aseptic meningitis. So this is uh, as of now not recommended. Oxytocin. Um, it is an, uh, a neuropeptide and there were animal studies and human studies showing that it has a role in uh, social communicative behaviors. And there are also some studies showing that there are altered oxytocin levels in autism. So uh, based on this, um, um, a meta-analysis of 28 uh, studies up to 12 weeks um, found that there is no significant effect on non-social domain, but there was a significant effect on social functioning. Uh, whereas uh, the other meta-analysis did not find any specifically look for adverse effects and they did not find any significant adverse effects. But again, these studies are also limited uh, that uh, they had small sample sizes and um, it cannot be generalized to the population. So probably we can conclude that there could be some benefits in the non-social domain, uh, in the social functioning, but no adverse effects in the short term, but we need further studies to see if uh, a higher dosage can help, uh, can be more effective and if, can, if it can be beneficial in the uh, Stem cell therapy. Um, so again, um, there is a possible immune system abnormalities in autism and increased neuroinflammation. Uh, and there were animal studies suggesting that immune, uh, stem cells uh, uh, had immunomodulatory capacity and uh, this improved uh, repetitive behaviors, cognitive rigidity, social approach, etc. And the benefits were seen up to six months. There were initial open label trials with smaller samples and uh, there were improvements reported um, in uh, not only in uh, symptoms of autism, but also there were changes in the brain uh, metabolism as well. But uh, since these studies had limitations, uh, then uh, Duke University took up a two-phase uh, trial the first one was an open label trial, which were included 25 children uh, in the age group of two to six years. And they found that almost 70% of children had improvement in one or more core symptoms of autism. And uh, they also found that children with uh, non-verbal IQ more than 70 had more improvement than the children with lower IQs. But again, this was a small sample and it was uncontrolled uh, study. So the phase two was started which was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled uh, crossover study um, with children uh, with non-verbal IQ more than 70 included. 180 children were included in uh, three arms. So one was a placebo arm, the other was autologous arm, wherein the children received their own cord blood, allogenic arm, which received cord blood from donors. And uh, placebo also received it uh, after six months because this is a crossover study. And uh, they found that uh, 
So uh, there were significant benefits in the subset of children who were four to seven years of age and had non-verbal IQ over 70. So, um, but this again uh, had a limitation. They found that out of these children, only one out one had a verbal IQ of more than 70 and the improvements in placebo arm were much bigger than predicted. So again, another phase two RCT has been initiated and is on its way, uh, but this appears uh, promising. So um, when we look at all this, there is a common theme that we have limited studies, the small samples, and uh, we know that uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity with respect to uh, these children. They are, have multiple different symptoms, uh, they're on different treatments, different comorbidities, and it's difficult to make uh, uh, effective comparisons um, based on this. And uh, broadly, if we have to summarize, um, melatonin seems to have good evidence uh, and appears safe for sleep issues. Uh, GFCF diet has insufficient evidence. And uh, amino acids, omega-3, probiotics, vitamins are all inconclusive, but they seem to be well tolerated in the short term. Chelation, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, secretin not recommended, and uh, still stem cell therapy appears to be promising. So, why is it important to discuss this with parents? They do not, they might not tell that they are using these things by themselves. They may fear dismissal uh, by the uh, physician or pediatrician, and uh, they may think that the doctor may not be aware of the benefits of some tre those treatments. So um, many of them use it because they feel that the uh, mainstream medications have a lot of side effects, but they are not aware that these molecules themselves, uh, we are not fully aware of their side effect profile or uh, with interaction with other drugs, allergies, contaminants, etc. since they are not regulated like prescription drugs. So American Academy of Pediatrics has given some guidelines on how to discuss this uh, with parents and families. I felt that uh, it is important to hear. So it is important to seek information and share it with the families and uh, evaluate for the evidence of these specific treatments if they are using any and identify and potential harmful effects or risks and in, uh, educate them about it, um, providing information to them on the various treatment options that we have and probably educate them on how to look at good studies and uh, avoiding outright uh, dismissing uh, the CAM or being defensive about it and uh, help them if they are using something, assist them in monitoring the response and uh, the safety of the chosen treatments and actively listening to them. So I would like to conclude by saying that it is important to have these conversations which are open with them and which are evidence-based so that they can make the choices after knowing about these uh, treatments. So uh, I would like to conclude the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nitya. Uh, that was a very nice, lucid, and crystal clear presentation, I can say. Uh, because so many uh, cities, so many, so much of information and evidence, and you have, you have very clearly explained which are promising, which are not, which are harmful, which are uh, encouraging. So I would want to uh, summarize all this. Before summarizing, I would say this. this uh, today, we are seeing so many parents finding it helpless. And they, they, find they, they, ask, they ask us what kind of medic medications can help them. And we know that today there is no clear-cut evidence uh, for any of the medicines for poor symptoms of autism. So what we are talking about more, mostly is about the comorbidity. And I, I'm talking about the mainstream medicine. So they turn towards the complementary medicines. So uh, not that all complementary medicines are promising, but some of them, that's what the evidence shows. So here, first you spoke, spoke about melatonin. Which is, which is safe and efficacious, especially for sleep disturbances. And that's the only medicine in the whole list which you are told, which has at least some good evidence. Rest of all, are, we are hearing these words, limited, inconclusive, yes. That is the state of affairs now with uh, the evidence which is still evolving. So with the NSTL system, yeah, there is some improvement in the ADHD and uh, like hyperactivity, irritability, but not at the core domain. And l carnison it is promising, yet uh, we have to find the evidence. Same thing with omega-3 fatty acids. Same thing with vitamin supplementation. So all these three 
or uh, the, the l carnosine omega 3 fatty acids vitamin supplementation we see very often most of the uh, uh, practitioners medical practitioners write these medications so especially with vitamin supplementations i can say that uh, those who are uh, who are uh, in the deficiency you know that they are malnourished you can go for it maybe uh, but still the evidence has to come and uh, some promising uh, evidence which are told on hyperactivity and speech and social awareness uh, is for tetrahydrobiopterin but still it's it's not conclusive and gfcf diet the most debatable topic which we uh, and, 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 and uh, we encounter with the patients because patients directly ask you so should we go ahead should we not go ahead so till now there is not there is no concluded with conclusive evidence and uh, here you said that uh, though there is some uh, positive effect noted by recent uh, meta analysis but there is another meta analysis which shows there is no effect to keller et al especially so the, in fact they said that there are some uh, gi side effects after after uh, starting the gfcf diet so uh, and also we should note for the malnutrition especially the children with autism have selective uh, eating uh, pro problems and uh, they also have a uh, difficulty in sleeping and the stress levels of the parents you, you spoke about them and also need for supplementation so as far gfcf diet maybe the conclusion is still that we the evidence is evolving so we can't conclude as you said rightly that we cannot uh, say uh, uh, um, valiantly that this gfcf diet doesn't work or works we have to give only the evidence to leave the parents to decide and there is no evidence as per your my understanding for secretin for chelation therapy in fact they are harmful for hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, and some some my, my like some evidence for probiotics because non rcts are showing some evidence but well designed rcts are not showing it so we we may expect some better evidence for that and ivig obviously because of the potential side effects at least now it is not recommended and oxytocin and stem cell therapy these are the last two uh, which are told uh, pro probably they are both of them are promising especially the stem cell therapy with proper rct double blind uh, placebo control crossover design study showing some uh, uh, promise with the benefits especially for high iq children so we, we still Uh, we cannot recommend it unless we have more rcts because this is the first rct which has been properly documented uh, the evidence and the anything else i missed maybe herbal medicine it's too heterogeneous too diverse and when we talk about uh, herbal medicine i i'm this is not the ayurvedic medicine this is chinese medicine so i don't know uh, the what kind of quality it is and it is shown as promising in 13 rcts but we don't know and camel milk definitely question mark because even if they show that evidence there there is a single group of uh, researchers who have given the two to both of the rct so we need more evidence so we can keep it again the question mark so with this i conclude that uh, i have i have i have learned a lot from you with this whole presentation so much of doubts so many doubts so we we still have to wait for a proper evidence to Confidently prescribe a medication in general for core symptoms of autism. Thank you, and yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ravi Khan, for summarizing it so beautifully and uh, keeping your points as well. Uh, I would just take up uh, the questions, and as expected, there are quite a few of them. Uh, first, couple of them on stem cell therapy. So, one question. The first one is: some parents ask about stem cell therapy. So, how to put forward? And uh, a comment that it comes as a surprise that it is promising. And one more, which is added to this, is: is there any difference in the stem cell which we use here, or versus U.S. or West? And are there different types? and uh, another comment clinically we have not seen much improvement with stem cell therapy especially in overseas patients right so this is all on stem cell therapy and if uh, dr mithya we can hear you again on stem cell therapy yeah uh, of stem cells so um, uh, i mean as of now um, though it appears promising um, it is still not a recommendation we don't have that much uh, evidence to say that it is still a recommendation 
and it is not in the guidelines. So I would not uh, still uh, make a suggestion that it is a um, evidence-based treatment or it is a uh, it, it will help with symptoms of autism. So that is something that cannot be promised right now. But probably uh, we can suggest to parents that we need to keep looking and see uh, with more trials that uh, you know if this benefit continues, then it will probably come as a recommendation. And uh, with respect to whether it is different here and in India and in US, I'm not uh, really aware uh, whether there is a difference in that. Um, what, what were the other uh, questions? Yeah, I would like, you know, many people have written that personally, they have not seen any improvements with stem cell therapy here in the patients or even the patients who are from the West and they have seen them here. And I guess I will second them, even I haven't seen and tons of them undergoing stem cell therapy and without really anything like, you know, fruitful coming out of it and they're investing so much in it, right? So I would just like to know, like, you know, whatever is written is fine, but have you seen anything promising in your patients who have undergone stem cell? Uh, not really. I mean, yes. I didn't have many patients coming back to me saying that they have taken, uh, in my experience, um, and my experience is quite, uh, I'm not a very senior practitioner. So uh, in my experience, uh, no, not yet. Right. So right. I would I would definitely wait for some guidelines to come uh, if there is benefit. I Perfect. would still, I would say wait. Yeah, wait and watch. Yeah. Yeah. So another one is any role on fetal microbiota transplantation? Uh, actually, along with probiotics, uh, even uh, fetal microbiota transplant was studied um, in the same study, same uh, meta-analysis. But uh, I mean, I didn't include it because it will it would become too many things and uh, prolong the topic. Um, but again, uh, there were not much benefits, and uh, the studies were very limited. So it is uh, we can say that as of now, we cannot conclude any benefits based on that. Right. And another one is like any role of serum levels of vitamins and three omega fatty acid levels. This is not directly like therapies, but like almost monitoring whatever supplements, etc. we are giving or you know, unless making an evidence for it. Yeah. Um, unless we suspect some kind of uh, deficiency or uh, say the child is on a, a GFCF diet or is very malnourished, then I would say there is a role. Otherwise, as a routine, uh, monitoring for deficiencies, I don't think is a recommendation um, right. according to the guidelines. Uh, role of modified Atkins diet? Um, I don't think we have much studies on this as far as I have looked. There were studies on GFCF diet and ketogenic diet. Uh, ketogenic both didn't have uh, conclusive or sufficient evidence for autism. Though we know that ketogenic diet is used in factory seizures and all that. Uh, at Kin's diet, I am not uh, really aware of um, uh, studies, much studies on this. And uh, in the meta-analysis or in the reviews that I have looked up, this was not mentioned. Right. So, and, and any biochemical markers for monitoring autism treatment? I guess this gets very wide, but I will just take, uh, get your take on it. Um, we do have behavioral markers as of now, uh, but um, no biochemical markers, to my knowledge, um, for uh, monitoring um, that have been recommended as such in the guidelines. Uh, any role for iron supplementation and uh, benefits with iron supplementation, especially, you know, children are milk fed in Indian diet and it's deficient in iron. So role of iron, we can say. Role of iron supplementation, again, uh, I would say uh, it, uh, case, it depends on a case-to-case -case basis. So if you are suspecting that uh, the child has uh, iron deficiency, um, then probably it could contribute to some behavioral symptoms also. So uh, it is only indicated when we uh, suspect, uh, not as a routine, uh, is what I would say. Uh, definitely, if you suspect that, then uh, we would definitely uh, uh, monitor the levels and then for treatment. Okay. And another one is like, you know, they want to recheck the carnosine, uh, what kind of symptoms it will have effect on. And many practitioners have uh, seen that it can increase aggression after starting. So your thoughts and your takes on this? Uh, I personally uh, uh, do not use any supplements. Uh, 
uh, I mean, my uh, opinion is that uh, it doesn't, um, uh, you know, it, it diverts the parents from the mainstream uh, treatments. So if anybody specifically asks for it, then um, I do give. And with uh, carnosine, I haven't seen much uh, behavioral issues as such when given, but it is definitely possible that uh, the, they could uh, develop some aggression if they do not tolerate. That would happen with any of the medications. Uh, definitely with carnosine, it is possible, is what I would say. Right. So a lot of comments on ex excellent talk and clearing the clouds and misconceptions. Any data on homeopathic medications and uh, anything? Because many parents go for it and they have their own experience on it. Um, I have looked up Ayurveda <clears throat> uh, and uh, many of these are not published uh, in these uh, uh, sites like you know we don't have so many publications so much um, you know they might be documented but uh, not there in renowned journals etc and um, as of now uh, there are more, not many studies I've looked up a few on Ayurveda um, on specific medications like Brahmi but they're all uh, very uh, you know poor study design and uh, um, not much uh, they, were, they did suggest improvements but uh, we cannot make, make any conclusions based on that. We need more research in these fields, as far as I know. But uh, I'm not the, the person to comment on this, maybe. Right. So any role on quercetin? Uh, that is quercetin. That's one question. Uh, sorry, what is that? I couldn't hear. Quercetin. You. you can see on the chat box and all. Yeah, I'll things. just open it. Uh, uh, not sure what that is, but uh, if anybody else could, um, you know, give any inputs on that, I'm not aware of benefits or role of quercetin. I haven't, I haven't heard either, but I, if Dr. Ravi Khan can throw a light or maybe Dr. Kavita or Dr. Naita. And also role of food allergy test. This is another question. So again, uh, food allergy, um, you know, if there is something like uh, lactose intolerance or something like that, then uh, going for tests is okay. But as a routine, if they have GI issues, then probably, but uh, not recommended as a routine is what I would say. Uh, gut, brain, endocrine access, your views. It is, uh, you know, it, it is something that has been extensively studied now. We need more evidence on this, more uh, data on, uh, you know, establishing that uh, this uh, uh, physiology of uh, autism. So as of now, all these are just hypotheses or uh, we have fewer studies, but not solid evidence to say that this is how it uh, results in uh, autism symptoms, say whether it is food allergy or uh, gluten casein diet contributing to autism symptoms or probiotics. Um, role of them. All of them, all of this is still uh, not proven is what I would say. Right. Any role of uh, cannabis oil? So we do have some cannabinoids, upcoming yes. studies on cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have uh, some, uh, this is a newer molecule that is being studied and did show some promising results. But again, uh, we are still looking at uh, larger studies for this. It is being studied now. It is one of the newer molecules that is being studied. And also omega-3 fatty acids and pyridoxin. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids and? Pyridoxin. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, with omega-3 fatty acids, as I uh, mentioned, uh, there seems to be no significant side effects and some uh, beneficial effects were seen in some studies, but not in all. There was mixed evidence, and uh, we also need better data on that. And uh, uh, pyridoxin, um, again, it is, uh, you know, it is not enough to uh, conclude that it is beneficial. Right. And another thing is like, uh, somebody is asked about, again, the exclusion diet avoidance of sugar, wheat, and milk. The role. Gluten diet. 
uh, avoidance of sugar, wheat, and milk. So obviously GFCF and plus they're asking about the sugars. Yeah. Um, restricting sugars is probably beneficial in children with hyperactivity. Uh, but GFCF diet as such, again, uh, you know, the evidence is, uh, is not uh, solid to say that it is beneficial. So, right. yeah. And the last one here on the Q&A, I can see a uh, role of ketogenic diet, which you already probably covered, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess personally, I would like to ask you, like, uh, you know, there's a lot of Cochrane and so much, so much, so much written on this topic, right? And we can see so many questions popping up. Uh, like, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of data on all these therapies as well, right? Uh, CBT or even behavior modification, occupational therapy, SIT, and so and so, and almost being considered like CAM itself. So what is your take on this? Since you said that, like, you know, you do not, you do not uh, give them supplements and CAM, et cetera, and you do not recommend. So what do you recommend? That's one. And number two is how do you see the role of uh, therapies really? Yeah. Um, so what I recommend- Evidence for therapies, I mean to say. Yeah. So as far as the evidence for therapies, we have uh, evidence for ABA-based. Uh, therapies primarily. Uh, so um, that is what is recommended. And uh, along with speech and occupational therapy um, is uh, something that we uh, recommend to all these children. And um, with respect to um, uh, other, th other, uh, other medications or the other things that we use, um, we all know the uh, irisperidone or aripeprazole for hyperactivity, irritability, aggression, etc or methylphenidate for ADHD comorbid symptoms. Um, and uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, some medications for anxiety for older children. But, um, um, and with respect to supplements, uh, specifically if uh, I feel there is a need for it uh, or somebody, uh, you know, um, uh, wants to try some supplements or wants to try diet, then I educate them about it. So um, this is what I, uh, I mean, this is what is the usual recommendations that I give to parents. Right, so great. So that means to summarize the managing comorbidities and deficiencies as and when and more of tailor-made for that particular patient and antipsychotics, right? And therapies, you do say that uh, evidence for ABA speech, uh, that is more... And and it is Thomas, important yeah. to tell them that each child is different and uh, the response to these interventions is going to be different. So it is important to focus and uh, give our best with respect to, uh, you know, giving time and participating in interventions. Uh, the parents participating and getting involved in the interventions is what I stress support. Right. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to know if there are any inputs from uh, Dr. Anaitha and Dr. Kavita and uh, Dr. Nagin. And otherwise, uh, we will be closing this session and wonderful session, I should say. Thank you. Excellent session. Thank you, Dr. Nitya. And thank you, Dr. Ravi, for moderating it. Thanks, Rachna. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitya. Thanks a lot. I mean, it was wonderful learning from you. Thank you. So Sneha will be closing. Yes, ma'am.